Thanks for joining us. I'm Nancy Furness, and this is We've Got Issues. We're filming today at Coquitlam City Centre Library, and we'd like to thank the library for providing a venue for these interviews. I would also like to acknowledge that our interviews take place on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded lands of Coquitlam First Nation. So we thank the Coquitlam people who continue to live on the lands and to care for the lands and the waters and all that lies above and below. So today we're joined by Matt Johnlick, who is a Coquitlam City Councillor. And thanks so much for taking the time to come in and, and talk to us me. today. Thanks for having me. Anytime. So you're well into your first term as City Councillor. Can you just... Yes, it's hard to say already that we are well into the first term. It won't be long <laughs> before it's the midpoint and then the term is over, um, up for a campaign again. But it's been a really exciting time. I've, I've greatly enjoyed it. You know, I pinch myself every day that I get to be lucky enough to do this job and meet so many different people, he learn, he see so many different things. And um, it's been an incredibly rewarding position. And, and the city's hard at work on a, a, a number of things that I know we'll be talking about today. Yeah, we're going to cover a little bit. Um, and I know we see you out and about around town, so you're one of the councillors that's out there and very visible. Um, we have a lot of things to talk <laughs> about, but one thing that I really want to spend some time on, if it's okay with you, is the housing issue. We've recently seen some new provincial housing legislation mm -hmm. brought in, um, specifically Bill 44 and 47. Can you... And 46 and 16. And 46 <laughs> and 16, <laughs> I know we could. But can you talk a little bit about what these bills mean yeah, uh, specifically and, to Coquitlam? And, and uh, you know, to, to, to put it simply, I mean, it's, it's a, a seismic shift in mm -hmm. terms of how housing gets approved um, and how it's shaped in, in communities and, and really what municipalities can do. Um, you know, there's no question about it. Housing is, is, is one of our number one issues uh, that I hear about affordability, cost of living. Right. Um, I'm the youngest member on our council living in a smaller place and it, it is that challenge I feel where, You're facing. you know, if I, if I had to move, uh, geez, I don't know how I'd be able to afford to stay in the city and I've, I'm elected to represent it. Um, so it's a challenge that I know a lot of not just young families, but even seniors, people across all ages mm -hmm. are, are faced with. And, and there is a need for more rental housing, subsidized housing, right. housing in general. Um, and, and how we go about doing that has, has changed a lot. Um, and, and I would say it has certainly been the, the biggest change for our planning and development department, uh, not just ours, but all cities uh, in a, a generation. So maybe just to summarize what they are, uh, Bill 44 basically means that every single single family lot is, is now rezoned for a fourplex. Right. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that a fourplex would get built in everyone. People could still build a single family home, but now it has been rezoned for, for four housing. So the, right. the zoning of a single family home effectively doesn't even exist anymore. Bill 47 uh, requires a, a rezoning around SkyTrain stations for, for a certain amount of density. So mm -hmm. uh, rings around the SkyTrain, there's three rings, the 200 meters, 400 meters, and 800 meters that, that now say a certain amount of density has to be approved around those. And it's an 800 meter by the crow flies ring, right. which in some around some sky trains is, you know, we're here in city center today, doesn't make a huge impact. We had already rezoned a lot of area around sky train for that, but it does encompass some areas that are are not zoned at all for density. So, so I use we the, will see some changes. Well, possibly. I mean, we you know I'll use the, one of the more extreme examples of this is where the the one size fits all policy and can have its downsides as. Inlet SkyTrain station in Port Moody. Right. If you draw an 800 right. meter circle around it, you end up with the end of Harbor View uh, mm -hmm. as part of that. The challenge, of course, with the end of Harbor View is there is a cliffside between yes. the uh, end of that street and getting down to Inlet. So unless we're building a zip line from a tower to, from there down to Inlet Station, uh, the density there is not going to quite work. So I don't think we're necessarily going to mean we're, we're going to be seeing that kind of density in the area, but it does require the city to rezone it. Um, the, the, the other challenge with it being is we, we had planned for a lot of townhouses, I think, around in that outer ring of SkyTrain stations. Mm -hmm. Well, now that that's for higher density, we need to find where we're going to put those townhouses. Interesting, because this is a, a minimum mandatory density mm -hmm. requirement. So for any community over 5,000, which is definitely Coquitlam, um, you are required by the province to make those changes. And I think the intent was to deal with 
our current housing crisis. Yeah. But can you talk a little bit about, you talked about affordable housing. Yeah. Do you think that this approach will resolve our affordable housing crisis? Yeah, and, and this is where, with, with these various pieces of legislation, I'll say the regulations are still being shaped. We're, we're, <laughs> we're still waiting on information from the province. Oh, okay. um, but the, the picture is becoming a little more clear. And, and I think with some of the, the changes, we're going to have to adapt. Mm -hmm. The way Coquitlam was doing affordable housing in terms of how we got on below market rental, how we were getting rental right. um, through a more incentive-based program, will now have to shift to maybe more of a stick approach than the carrot. Uh, I think there is still oh, a path okay. to us getting affordable housing online. Right. Um, since I got on council, um, and I know all my colleagues are committed to it around the, the topic of affordable housing, but we have been having some discussions about how do we get more below market rental? How do we get more rental? And I think you'll see some of that coming out soon. So just to clarify though, there's no requirement in this new housing legislation to have affordable or below market housing incorporated? Bill 16, which is the most recent piece of housing legislation, gives municipalities the ability to do what's called inclusionary zoning, ah, which okay. forces uh, right. below market and affordable housing into the project. Um, some cities had already been doing that. Mm. Um, Coquitlam's approach was a little bit different, right. but I think you will be seeing um, Coquitlam come out with some new policies to ensure I, I, I'm hoping um, more below market rentals than what we're seeing and, and more rental given the, the need for that is, is yes. uh, I would say at its highest. Okay, no, that's good to hear. So when you first ran for Coquitlam City Council in 2022, you said your number one issue was making sure we plan for complete communities. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about how this new housing legislation does or does not support it complete Community? Yeah, it, it, it makes it a bit more challenging, I, I have to confess, because what, what happens now is that we've we've opened the floodgates basically to to development of fourplexes and, and more density where perhaps in the past council could control the sequencing of development a little bit better. So So regulate it. Regulate it a little bit more. Yeah. So for example, uh, you know, there are some areas where we were already seeing, we had rezoned it for fourplexes. Right. We were seeing the fourplexes come in. We could make the infrastructure upgrades for that. New legislation doesn't make a huge difference. But there are other parts of the city where uh, they're quite a bit older. Uh, the sewer system is quite a bit older. The, the amenities aren't in place. There's not a commercial area nearby. And now they're open up to see more density. Oh. Well, how do we now plan for right. sewer upgrades and road upgrades when we don't necessarily know where mm. the construction is going to happen um, as much. So it creates that challenge of being able to plan where where do we put the affordable housing, where do we put the commercial areas, where do we need to see the transit, uh, the schools. It just makes planning for the future uh, a little more uncertain, I would say. So it's, it is one of the, I would say, downsides of what, of what we've seen. Um, you know, municipalities, in my view, are very good at planning um, their communities. Well, you know uh, your community. Because we know the community. A lot of work has gone into that. We're, we're you know, the city council and mayor, we're, we're the people that are on the ground. We, and, and I think most councils were doing a pretty good job of that. Um, I know there were some bad actors in, in other municipalities that I think forced the province's hand to put forward this legislation. But um, it, it certainly makes planning all the more challenging because the reality is now we just don't know where we're going to be needing to make infrastructure upgrades right. and, and new schools, and new schools they take a and, long time and to... it creates the financial uncertainties yeah. too so there might be areas where maybe we need to pump the brakes all those areas and development mm -hmm. of it or where we're opening up development because there are other areas that are going to be redeveloping faster than anticipated right and as we you simply say, don't know and that don't that's know. the challenge is we yeah. just don't know everything i'm describing perhaps it doesn't come to fruition right. perhaps it's worse we but again, you don't we know. We don't know, and and this yeah. makes it hard to to plan. And I've I've learned in, in my short time at the council table. I mean, you're making decisions to plan ahead for the next five to ten years. Well, it's pretty hard to do that when we don't know what development might be looking like in ten years. Well, and if we talk about things like parking, is mm -hmm. there are there parking requirements built into this? Parking requirements are gone completely yeah. now. Um, this is quite a change as now you'll see uh, that if a developer in the transit areas, yes. um, if they want to put in a tower, there are no parking requirements. Right. So now there's a concern that council could be seeing uh, an influx of street parking, which creates challenges for existing conflict. neighborhoods. Conflict. 
Um, certainly would not want, I, do, I don't want us to go to a, uh, a situation where we're having to do permit parking on the streets. It becomes something, um, the, the administration of it, the enforcement of it is, is highly expensive. Mm -hmm. um, that means taxpayers have to pay more for it. Um, you know, in, in my conversations with developers, I, at the end of the day, they want to sell units and, and people right. want it's parking when they problem. buy a unit. So yeah. I, I don't expect that we're going to be seeing towers with no parking. Yeah. Um, but it's one of these dangers of we've left it to the market now and what will the market decide? Well, as we've seen with housing, when we left it to the market completely, <laughs> we didn't get a great outcome. No, uh, so it's, it's a concern, right? It is a concern. I'm, I'm, I am all for some parking relaxations, perhaps, in, in areas the right next trains. to SkyTrain. Yeah. I live near a SkyTrain in an older four-story building. Mm -hmm. We have tons of parking stalls that are sitting empty. Um, People aren't driving as much, especially Maybe you can when rent they do. Them out. <laughs> well, perhaps we'll be needing to. <laughs> so, oh. it is so one of the difficulties. Now you've had to. The city of Coquitlam, like all other municipalities over five thousand, have had to um, redo your OCP. Mm -hmm. um, has that caused any issues within the city? Like I know resources are limited. Resources are limited. Uh, we're in the process of, of that OCP review right now. That'll that'll take place over the course of 2025. So we still have some time to do that. Okay. Um, we were due for an OCP review anyways. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of uh, cleaning up in, in the OCP outdated language terms. It's It was, it was quite an old document. So um, we were overdue, but uh, still it's it goes back to with the housing legislation I can't stress enough how seismic of a, a shift it was. Mm -hmm. And the, it's not just our planning and development department, but you know, we've been talking about sewers and roads. Well, that's our right. engineering and public works. Uh, how do we plan for it financially? Well, that's our finance well, department. It brings everybody you know, in. Everyone is involved. So yeah. other projects that I think we, we were focused on have had to right. go on a bit of a pause, right? So we can divert resources into digesting this legislation. Can I bring one more factor, maybe two in? Um, first of all, so for, oops, are you okay? Good. Okay, so um, I just wanna talk about all the work that Coquitlam and other municipalities have, too, have done on climate action plans mm -hmm. and you know, trying to plan for climate ready housing and to make sure that we have resilient neighborhoods mm -hmm. and communities. How does this legislation affect that? Are we still seeing? It, it's largely silent on it, which again goes back to where where we have a lot of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. um, you know, our, our we're, we're embarking on our first urban uh, urban forest management strategy, yeah. which is exciting. It's, I, it's, it's due. Yes. Um, but we now don't with with densification um, happening all over that could have impacts on on our urban forest management tree canopy coverage. Uh, I, I think with tree canopy coverage, though, it's well. There's a few things on it w with our climate action plan because we also talk about energy step codes. Some of right. the work there's, we're doing there. Right. They're too there. There's a variety separate. of pieces yeah. there. Yeah. Um, and, and you know, I'm hopeful. And I think we we can head towards moving into things more like the zero carbon step code. Still moving into um, just generally more electrification mm -hmm. charging stations. So I think we're heading that way. But um, but that's something you have to do eventually, anyways. But you're speeding that up. Is that correct? We'll see. Uh, okay. That's, uh, oh, that's, that's still okay. TBD. Um, oh, okay. uh, my, my personal view is, you know, I, I think the more time that we give developers um, to adjust, it's like doing your homework. You don't want to do it the night before. Better right. to do it in advance and get okay. it done um, so you're not stressed to do it at the last minute. Right. Makes sense. <laughs> uh, but on our urban forest uh, and our tree canopy coverage, mm -hmm. I think we're going to have to really focus on public spaces for trees, mm -hmm. uh, the public boulevards, areas where we can. And, and, and that was something I think we were going to have to do with densification anyways, uh, is really looking at utilizing the land that the city owns to be planting trees, because that's where we can ensure that we own them, we protect them. Um, and that where they're they're going in um, spaces that perhaps aren't as um, densified, anyways. And uh, I, you know, I can think to an example of um, the multi-use path that we're looking to go in uh, along Nelson Street, right? With some of the boulevard upgrades, sidewalks coming in, there's an opportunity to put in some more green in that space. Right. So, can I ask you a question, which I'm not clear on myself? Um, tree bylaws. So, the city has some um, tree bylaws in place. Mm -hmm. Will this new housing legislation override those tree bylaws, or will you still have the authority to implement your tree bylaws and say that you can only take down so many trees, or 
or does uh, density trump our, trees? Our, our understanding, and again, this is where we're, we're, we're still flying blind to, to yeah. a degree. The picture is becoming clearer, but we're still uncertain. But you're being asked to plan. Is, within, well, exactly, within right? And this area. is what has made things yeah. so difficult over the, this last almost year now with, mm -hmm. with uh, uh, the implementation of the housing legislation. Um, our, our understanding is largely that those bylaws are unaffected, that they would still They're have... They're being superseded? Th no, that they oh, would not be superseded. Not. We okay. think there's... But oh, that's interesting. The picture is still foggy. <laughs> I think we need to get clarification on oh, that. Oh, we've been asking. <laughs> I would love some. <laughs> yeah, because if we think about climate resilient communities and trees, they're intrinsically connected, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. So you take down your trees, even if you have trees in public spaces, that's great. But to have trees in proximity to housing, you know, mental health, the cooling effect, um, we have to talk about the urban heat island mm -hmm. effect and all well, of those and, things. And I think too in Coquitlam we need to also really think about our, our tree canopy coverage being where where it is, right? We're, we probably are on the higher end of cities with tree canopy coverage, but that's also because we border the urban containment boundary. We're, yes. we're on the doorsteps of... Burke Mountain up higher. Many hectares yeah. of, of wilderness. I was just up at Coquitlam Lake and seeing all the beautiful forests that we have on our doorstep. It's gorgeous. The old uh, growth. <laughs> but you go into some other pockets of the city mm -hmm. where that doesn't exist as much. And um, you, you can really see it on a heat map. I've seen heat maps of the city and you can yes. see where those areas where um, tree canopy coverage wasn't planned as much. Um, it gets hotter. And, and I think that's something we always have to think about too, is the equity mm -hmm. part of it. Like what areas are not getting those that tree canopy coverage? Mm -hmm. And it's usually the more vulnerable mm -hmm. communities or the lower income Well, and, and we see it in areas where there, you know, if you just put out all cement and no green coverage and it's a hot yeah. day, I mean, we, we just saw with the farmer's market and, and Port Coquitlam was Absolutely. hot, right? It's, it's, you it's, take it's, down it's, all the trees and you and end up with a heat All bowl. of a sudden you have a, just this one cement block that just sucks the heat in and yeah. cooks everything above it. And, and you can't use it. It's dangerous. You, it becomes a danger, exactly. Yeah. And with hotter days in the summer coming, it's, it's something we're going to have to plan through. It's, it's not just that it's about having a nice feeling with cooler weather, or looking at the, the nice trees. Yes. Um, it's also a safety issue. It is. It's a human health concern. Mm -hmm. um, Coquitlam has been doing some really good work. I know you're taking trees down too um, with densification, mm -hmm. and I think that's a little bit inevitable. But Coquitlam has also been doing some really amazing work with their Park Spark and Tree mm -hmm. Spree, um, getting public education out there, doing free tree giveaways yep. and planting trees like crazy. Oh, we have uh, an amazing crew there. Uh, there, uh, I'm always marvel at the passion that the, mm -hmm. the folks, the, the arborists that we have um, that work for the city, their love of trees and how they're able to, to bring that to the community here. Um, you know, every time we have an event and we're giving out trees, it's, it's just oh, this, it's oversubscribed. Um, people yeah. really want to get trees and plant them. No, you're, you're right. There's a lot of passion there. So that gives us hope mm -hmm. to see that. And it, it's wonderful to see people also engaging, right, and learning about why trees are important in their own neighborhood. Um, so is there anything else you want to add or talk about the housing on the housing front, are there any other challenges? Well, it's it's just the challenge of implementing. Um, mm. I, I like to equate it to you know the ask the province has made of local government is to to take a giant plate of food and eat it really fast and try not to digest it and try and try to digest it without <laughs> hurling it back up. Um, it's a crude analogy, That's a but very it is really. It, it is. Uh, it is, and it's <laughs> yeah. it's 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 a challenge. It's yes. and I've, I talked to uh, some of my fellow councillors and other municipalities, and the the thing is that they're all struggling with it and affecting affected by it in different ways because, right. you know, what affects Coquitlam, yeah, pretty similar to Burnaby, but quite different to Delta where they can't build the kind of density, right. and also different to a place like. Port Moody, uh, and well, you've got some different topography, different topography, and, and then you and have two, some two sky train stations in close proximity. In like close there's every proximity, situation. right? Where in a very small geographic mm -hmm. area, and then really hearing from councillors from small places, um, villages that might only be or small towns of only five thousand. Where when you're right on that edge of you, five thousand, you literally don't have the staff to. Yes. You know, it might only be in a town of five thousand. You might only have a few people that are working at City Hall tops. Redoing so that OCP. How do you redo do you know, that when yeah. you've got, you know, your your head planner is also right. your head engineer and your head, you know, your city manager and it's 
And it's also a, for places like that, where does the money come for this infrastructure that needs mm -hmm. to go along with the developments, mm -hmm. right? Does that come from municipal or is that coming from Well, and, and this is the other change with the development is how we finance things. Mm -hmm. is it, it has made a, a, a massive difference in how we can get the money from developers to pay for growth. Oh, that's, my, yes. my belief is that when development comes in, that the, the development charges that are faced the, should pay for the amenities that come in, the sewer upgrades, the, the road upgrades, that's what we get from development. And, and that is built into developers performa. They is, build it into the land costs when they acquire property. Is and that changing under the new legislation? It, it is changing quite a bit. And, and there certainly is a concern that we're not going to be able to raise as much money mm -hmm. to pay for things like Daycare Mountain Rec Center, um, uh, roads, sewers, right. that that I, I fear that there could be a push from the province to, to be asking for. Wow. Uh, property taxpayers to pay more. Um, but, so keeping you busy, we'll see. And, and then who's going to be coming after who about mm -hmm. the property tax mm -hmm, increase, mm -hmm. right? You'll be in the direct line But there. I think we're, and all of council uh, in Coquitlam agrees, that it's growth should pay for growth. That is one of right. our, our philosophies there, that it shouldn't be that existing residents have to pay for the growth that comes into the community. It should be from the developers who are making big dollars to right. bring in these projects. Okay, well, sounds like you're going to be busy for a little while longer mm -hmm. working through all of that. Um, I wish you all the best on that. <laughs> Can we go and talk about another situation yes, that's been in the news lately? Mm -hmm. And I just wonder, can you give me some thoughts on 3030 Gordon? I yeah. Know, what's I, happening? So, so certainly we have seen more challenges at 3030 Gordon over the last uh, uh, few months. And, mm -hmm. and I think it coincides with uh, the closure of the Sure Stay Hotel. Um, the lease there expired. I, I, my understanding is the owner no longer wanted to, to be using it as supportive housing. Okay. Um, we've seen some of our outreach workers lose grants um, from the federal government. Um, oh, okay. That funding dried up. And so this perfect storm of mm. supports, losing supports and beds in the Tri-Cities um, has resulted in a, a, an encamp encampment outside of 3030 Gordon. Right. Um, 33rd Gordon still is the only supportive housing site and shelter space for the Tri-Cities. Um, this is, this, I mean, if we were to think of the Tri-Cities as one community, I mean, that would be the fourth biggest municipality in BC. Um, so to have just one shelter space is, is not adequate when we've had an 86% increase in homelessness since the, the count in 2020 or 2021. Um, and an affordability crisis. Affordability crisis, a toxic drug supply crisis, uh, mental health crisis, mm -hmm. and all of these things have come together to mm -hmm. create, I think, the challenges that you're now seeing outside of the shelter. Um, you know, there, there are a few things with it. One, simple math, the shelter's full. Right. We, we need more supportive housing. We, right. we, we had another site, it's gone. We need to look at another site for supportive housing. Um, the other piece is that 3030 Gordon was set up in 2015. Um, the supports that are there, the way it functions, was a, is a 2015 model that we would not be using. So how would in that change from 2020, 2015 to now? What would you? Like more, wrap, more wraparound supports, mm -hmm. the psychiatric supports, the mental mm -hmm. health care supports. Right now at 3030, the extent of the supports would be for um, what's called iHeart. Um, it's a, a group of nurses, work for Fraser Health, to come in and do uh, wound care, prescription refills. Important work, right. but just one but piece. But the basic. Of the basics, keep right? Keep people and, going. Um, yeah. it's, it's, it's not resolving the more entrenched issue. So who funds 3030 Gordon? Well, it would be operated by Rain City and then funded through BC Housing in the province. So that's provincial. That's all funded. provincial. Okay. Our, our difficulty as a municipality is, and I, I get question. I, I have been getting frequent questions about it, is you know, we, we don't build, operate, or fund supportive housing. Okay. We need the province to do that. It's, it's completely out of our bailiwick. Um, it never has been. No, no municipality does that. Um, but we need, the, we need to work with the province. And, and I'm hoping there's going to be some progress made sooner rather than later. Okay. Uh, you know, Minister Kalan was, was in the Tri-City News saying he's coming to meet with Coquitlam. So we're hoping that that's going to be a be productive some movement forward. Because, you know, really there's people's lives involved mm -hmm. in that. And well, uh, we their, need... their lives and, and we know they're local. These, mm -hmm. you know, these are not people that are coming from way out yonder, right? right. These are people that were by and large when you talk to them, were living in the Tri-Cities before they were homeless. Um, we find that through the count, and in most cases with municipalities, they will find that the homeless people in their community were living in the community, or maybe a neighboring community, um, 
before they were homeless because okay. they still have connections to the area. So, they so these are people there. that belong here, mm -hmm. they have a place here, and we need to mm -hmm. make sure that those supports well, they're, are they're, they're, Though they might not have a, a, a fixed address, they're as much residents as anyone else. Yeah. Well, thank you for your, your thoughts and insights on that. I appreciate it because I know, Matt, we've covered some difficult territory oh, there and I really appreciate you being so open and, um, you know, sharing information and, and helping to clarify things for us. I would just like to give you the opportunity to tell us some good things that are happening in Coquitlam and some things that you've been working on that you would like to share. Sure, no, 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 absolutely. I mean, we, we are in the library today, so I would be remiss to, to miss a chance to talk about still that the Burke Mountain Rec Center and the new Burke Mountain Library are still underway. We're, we're in the process of designing and bringing those forward and, and construction starting um, later oh. this term. So that's that's very exciting. Very exciting to see. There. Yeah, and, and, and much needed. Um, uh, thrilled uh, about uh, our, our, um, our partnership with Success, where we are, Coquitlam is bringing forward some se um, affordable seniors housing uh, at the Millardville oh. Community Center and over on, um, uh, uh, down on Sydney off uh, Lougheed in the southwest Coquitlam. So we have two affordable seniors housing sites that we're building on city land um, that's going to be really exciting and prioritizes Coquitlam seniors. Um, so they can, who are maybe struggling with rent, stay are able in to the stay in the community and have affordable rent. So right. those projects are underway. Really excited about those. And um, on the environmental side, uh, council not long ago adopted a, a new bylaw for water qu uh, water quality monitoring, uh, real time so water real -time. quality monitoring across nice. all development sites that go into the ground. Um, uh, parkades, of course, that's where you dig in the ground. Water tables, mm -hmm. you can deal with issues of pollution getting into creeks. So this new real time water quality quality monitoring bylaw requires developers to have the technology on site that would monitor the the discharge and ensure that it's not getting discharged out into rivers or the community uh, because it's constantly monitoring and then we'll recircle the water right. for cleaning before it goes back And with increased out. development, that's it's very, very important. more important. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. So all really good stuff. Yeah. Um, I want to thank you again so much thank for coming Thank you for in. the invite. I, I hope we can it. talk again soon because Anytime. I feel like we have lots to talk oh, about. Oh, there's so much more we didn't even get a chance <laughs> to talk about today. We'll save it for the next one. Next time. <laughs> all right. Thanks for joining us. I've uh, been talking with Matt Johnlick, who is a Coquitlam City Councillor.